three, two, one. Uh huh. Uh huh. One, two, three. Should be media check for handheld line level. One, two, three. Three, two, one. All good. Hopefully, in the marquee, you can hear me as well. So, good morning and welcome. We'll be starting shortly. Media test. Are we all happy? One, two, three. Three, two, one. Thank you. Is there a is there a Mike Allen in the room? Mike Allen. Oh, is that him? Is it on? Okay, okay. Will Neald. Will Neald. At all? Anywhere? campaign manager for Northampton North. It's been a busy year but we're making real progress. My focus has been on growing our membership and recruiting new activists. We have a fantastic team out knocking on doors and hearing from residents all year round. Because of this we have a team ready to win at the next election. My name is Akram Mwanga. My role is Borough Campaign Manager for Barking and Nuren. My role involves bridging the communication gap between the association offices and the volunteers and also the voters and also CCHQ. I'm the go-to man. My name is Rhys Fox and I'm the Borough Campaign Manager for Enfield and Haringey. When I started in Enfield and Haringey in 2017, my main aim was to build capacity. My team were going out once a week with maybe one or two people. Now, in 2019, they're going out three times a week 
we've tripled that figure and that capacity building programme is really paying off. It's been hard work but now that the association has me as a full-time campaign manager we can work together to get more members and more activists and it's working. We've managed to grow our membership by more than a third in just 12 months. It's partly because of the approach we take. I'm a big believer in making campaigning fun. My priorities for the future are training and more training, getting more volunteers and we need to get the support base for the party to carry out a massive campaign. We need to get more volunteers and capable to go onto the doorstep and engage with voters on a day-to-day -day basis. It is thanks to your support that we can continue to build capacity. Across the country, campaign managers like me are doing great work, winning elections, raising money and bringing in new members. Labour are ready. In the last seven months, they have recruited 102 members of staff. So with your support, we can continue to build capacity and take the fight to Labour. Hi, I'm Jess and one year ago I was hired as the campaign manager for Northampton North. It's been a busy year but we're making real progress. My focus has been on growing our membership and recruiting new activists. We have a fantastic team out knocking on doors and hearing from residents all year round. Because of this we have a team ready to win at the next election. My name is Akram Wanga, my role is Borough Campaign Manager for Backing and Nuren. My role involves bridging the communication gap between the association offices and the volunteers and also the voters and also CCHQ. I'm the go-to man. My name is Rhys Fox and I'm the Borough Campaign Manager for Enfield and Haringey. When I started in Enfield and Haringey in 2017, my main aim was to build capacity. My team were going out once a week with maybe one or two people. Now, in 2019, they're going out three times a week with triple that figure and that capacity building programme is really paying off. It's been hard work, but now that the association has me as a full-time campaign manager, we can work together to get more members and more activists, and it's working. We've managed to grow our membership by more than a third in just 12 months. It's partly because of the approach we take. I'm a big believer in making campaigning fun. My priorities for the future are training and more training, getting more volunteers and we need to get the support base for the party to carry out a massive campaign. We need to get more volunteers and capable to go onto the doorstep and engage with voters on a day-to-day -day basis. It is thanks to your support that we can continue to build capacity. 
Across the country, campaign managers like me are doing great work, winning elections, raising money and bringing in new members. Labour are ready. In the last seven months, they have recruited 102 members of staff. So with your support, we can continue to build capacity and take the fight to Labour.
Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to the fourth live semi-final of Toys Have Got Talent. That one's probably going to wear a bit thin by the time we get to the 16th hustings, so I'm going to have to think of something uh, new for that. Well, welcome to uh, Exeter, and this is the fourth of the hustings that the two candidates are taking part in. We had Birmingham on Saturday, who could forget that? Um, there was a digital hustings on Tuesday, Bournemouth yesterday, and then tomorrow, immediately after this, we're going to Carlisle tomorrow morning, then Manchester tomorrow afternoon, Belfast on Tuesday. So I don't think anyone can say that they're not being taken through their paces. Now let me tell you the format of what's going to happen today. Um, Boris Johnson will speak first, Jeremy Hunt second. They'll speak for up to seven minutes. Then I will interview them all for about, both of them for ten minutes. And then it's over to you for questions. Now the questions have been submitted in advance. I've selected those questions. I've had no interference from anyone at CCHQ. It's entirely uh, my choice of questions. Um, and I will follow up if I don't think that they've answered the question in as much detail as possibly they ought to have done. Um, the event is being streamed live on the Conservative Facebook page and Twitter feed. I think Sky News and possibly the BBC are also taking it. Um, it's also a bit of a family affair because we have Stanley Johnson with us today. Okay. And we have Jeremy's sister and his nephews and nieces. So the reason I wanted to introduce them is to ensure that there's no booing this time. But you look, at, you look a very polite audience. So we have a warm-up act before we hear from Boris Johnson. Um, his name is Andrew Sharp. He's chairman of the Conservative Party National Convention. Please give him a warm welcome. Andrew Sharp. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, yeah, warm-up act. There's no pressure then. <laughs> Um, so, as Ian said, I'm Andrew Sharp, I'm Chairman of the National Convention, and it's an honour and a privilege to welcome you here today to this third of the physical hustings, not the, uh, the online one, um, for our leadership candidates around the country. And it's great to see so many people here. Um, it was packed yesterday in Bournemouth, as, as some of you know, because I saw some of you there too. Um, and it's great to see the, the membership of the party engaging on such a massive scale with this, with this exercise. Not least because it's actually very good news for our party. You will have seen um, some very positive commentary coming out of the Birmingham hustings that uh, Ian, <coughs> Ian hosted at the weekend, um, including the accolade from the FT, no less, that the questions that were asked were spot on. Um, that's very good news, and that will help to dispel the typical media narrative about us as members of our party. But of course, the media are here, as Ian has said, so in order to prevent unflattering pictures, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest you spend the next hour and a bit breathing in, okay? <laughs> Um, look, the party that I and my national convention officers know, and the one that we see every week as we travel around the country, is made up of engaged men and engaging women of every colour, faith, age, sexual preference. They're all united by their belief in our country. Um, they're our, institu our institutions and an unshakable tradition of public service. They're also, of course, um, admirably committed to campaigning for this party in all weathers. And I've never met anybody in our party who cares where you come from. We only care where you're going. And that's really important because there's far more that unites us than divides us. And as Lord Hailsham said, conservatism is not so much a philosophy as an attitude, a constant force for performing a timeless function in the development of a free society. So we're here to undertake a solemn duty as part of that commitment to a free society because we're not just electing a party leader, we're electing a prime minister. Now, the country we love would expect us to ensure that this process is rigorous, and of course Ian is here to make sure it is. But we need a Prime Minister who will deliver Brexit and beat our political opponents. And those of us who knock on doors week in and week out know that many of our opponents are far less committed to that free society than we are. So we made the case at the party board that the leadership campaign had to reach every part of the United Kingdom and that all members um, should have access to at least one hustings. And there really was no disagreement about that. So at this point, I'd like to thank the party chairman, the Right Honourable Brandon Lewis MP, for his support. And I'd also actually like to thank him more generally here for his support for the voluntary party. Um, in that, he's been very consistent, and we enjoy far more resources than we have done for many years, and that's in large part down to him. I'd also like to thank the logistics team at CCHQ, led by Tom Skinner, who I can't see, but he's in here somewhere, um, and also the conferences team led by David Comerford. 
they have done a fantastic job in a very short period of time. I know that there's been some, some disquiet on one or two WhatsApp groups, but as you can imagine, organising all these hustings is a massive undertaking. And finally, I'd like to thank your regional team, led by Peter Booth, the regional chairman. As you'll know, Peter is a tireless advocate for the South West um, and is deservedly held in very, very high regard. So before I hand over, just one last thing. You will have seen on your chairs when you came in um, adverts for the campaign manager's programme. Can you please take a moment to read that and please do engage with it? Um, as you may or may not know, but where we have campaign managers, we do generally do better. Where we don't, we don't do as well. Um, but this is a hugely expensive undertaking. And at the moment, we're rather overly reliant on others to pay, help us pay for it. Now, can we be proper to conservatives and, and help ourselves, please? Um, it would be very good if you could engage. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back over. Um, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Enjoy your morning and make sure your questions are spot on. Okay, thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to welcome contestant number one, Boris Johnson. How are you? Morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you very much, Ian. Good morning, everybody. I, I speak as somebody, of course, who uh, grew up on a Exmoor hill farm, spectacularly unprofitable as it was, uh, who learned to swim in the X, still goes shopping from time to time in, in Exmoor, and therefore it's absolutely wonderful to be here in, in Exeter. The, other end of the river here in the West Country. Now, look, folks, I know there are some people who say that our party is in a bad way. And there are some people who point out that uh, we are on, I think, about 17, 18, 19 points in the polls, depending on which one you look at. And indeed, it was very disappointing that in the most recent national election, we scored 9%. I don't think I've known a time <laughs> when our party has got 9% in a national uh, election. And it is also true that we have two other parties who are profiting from our difficulties in the sense that we have the Brexit party and the Liberal Democrats, like two opportunistic puffballs feeding saprophytically on the sense of decay in trust in politics that is going on at the moment. And uh, I, I acknowledge that we have all these, uh, all these problems, but I say to you that the hour is darkest before the dawn, my friends. And we can turn this thing round and we can go forward to win. We really, really can. And there are just three things that we need to do and three things that we need to get right. And number one, the first and most important thing you need to do in the next few months is what? It is to get Brexit done and come out of the EU on October the 31st. That is right, on the 31st. Let's get it done. Let's get going. And everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows the rough shape of the deal that we have to do. We have to be very friendly to our uh, European Union nationals, 3.2 million who are here in this country. Let's take uh, that part of the withdrawal agreement, the otherwise defunct withdrawal agreement, put it into law and treat them in the way we should have treated them three years ago. Number two, let's take the money, the 39 billion, and put it in a state of, uh, let's say, uh, creative ambiguity uh, suspended over the, over the negotiations until such time as we get what we want. Uh, and let's take the questions of the Irish backstop and how to solve the problems of uh, frictionless borders at, uh, at, in all Ireland and indeed in every uh, border between the UK and the rest of the EU. Let's remit all that quite sensibly for resolution in the context of the free trade agreement that we're going to strike with our friends and partners after we come out on October the 31st. That's what we're going to do. And it's a, it's a very, very simple. And there's a way to, there's a way to ensure that we, we, we get that done, and that is, of course, to prepare to come out on WTO terms, or to prepare to get ready to come out on no deal. And this is a great country, isn't it? Yeah. It's a fantastic country. We can do it. We can get ready. And, of course, there are some people who will say that the UK is simply not capable of coming out on no deal. And I've heard people argue that the planes won't fly and there won't be any drinking water, and, indeed, that there won't be any glucose or, or milk solids or whey to provide the, the, the children of this country with Mars bars. And I, well, I, want to, I want you to know that whatever happens on November the 1st, whatever, whatever deal we strike, uh, the planes will fly. And there will be drinking water. And there will be not only glucose and milk solids, but there will be way for our, for our children to eat in their Mars bars. Where there's a will, there's a way, uh, my friends. Uh, you can see that one. You can see that one coming. And when, we, and when we've done that, we will be able to take forward a great 
modern progressive conservative agenda and unite our country. And, and very, very simply, what I want to do as, as your Prime Minister is to bring this country together in the way that I was able to bring London together from during the eight years that I ran it. And when I began, uh, I just remind you, we had four of the six poorest boroughs in the whole of the UK. When I ended, we had none of the poorest 20. That was because we invested in transport infrastructure, because we cut crime uh, very considerably, uh, because we boosted education across the city. And that is what we are going to do with the whole of the UK, starting, of course, in the southwest, improving, <laughs> improving our... And isn't it time the A303 was modernised and, and, and dual? I, frankly, I think... Thank you. I'm glad you agree. I've been driving it for about 50 years, and it's absolutely... Well, more than 50 years. It's absolutely incre incredible that it should, should rem remain substantially the same. We need to... Uh, I think that the education funding uh, needs to be levelled up around... Do you not agree? I think it's quite extraordinary that, uh, that parts of rural England have failed to keep pace uh, with provision, per capita provision for education. So what the first thing we're going to do, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, we level up education funding around this country. The third thing... <laughs> third thing we need to do is, of course, to make sure to make sure that everywhere in this country has proper full fibre broadband. It is an utter disgrace, an utter disgrace that there are parts of rural Spain that have speed of light access to the internet, many parts of rural uh, England, rural Britain, uh, that where people are staring at the revolving pizza wheel of doom, unable, uh, no, no confidence. And, and if, if we get all these things done, get it done fast, then, of course, that will drive business investment, it will drive growth, it will drive productivity and employment. And of course, it will enable us uh, to invest yet more through the tax revenues that we produce in fantastic public services such as the NHS, such as defence and all the things that we care about. And that is the symmetry at the heart of our modern conservative vision. It's a very, very simple idea. And we need to get it across with a new clarity, a new power and a new conviction. And we need to do it because there is one man who stands in the way of the progress of this country. And we all know who he is. He is the leader of a cabal of superannuated Marxists from London. Uh, he's called Jeremy Corbyn, and I don't want him anywhere near the government of this country. Do you want him? Absolutely not. This is a guy who would not only whack up taxes on virtually everything you could think of, from pensions to income to gardens to inheritance to financial transactions in order to pay for his crazed programme of renationalisation. He backs Hamas, he backs Hezbollah, he supports the mullahs of Tehran when it comes to the current dispute over what's going on in the Persian Gulf. And when there were poisonings in Salisbury, Jeremy Corbyn stood up on the side of Vladimir Putin and the Russian state. Do we want this guy in charge of the government of our country? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We can defeat him. And let me just remind you in conclusion that the last time that I had to face an emanation of that weird cabal of, Lo of the London Labour left, I was able to beat them and beat Ken Livingston when we, our party, was 17 points behind in London. We came from behind to win. We can win again. We must win again. And with your help, we will win again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should we have a nice gentle one to start with? Of course. Yeah, thank you. Any, 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 any kind you like. <laughs> a couple of hours, Theresa May, a couple of hours ago, Theresa May met Vladimir Putin in Osaka. What should she have said to him? Would you like to normalise relations with Russia? Do you know, one of the saddest things that, that uh, I, I discovered in, in the Foreign Office is that every uh, British Prime Minister, every Foreign Secretary comes into office, I think, in the last 10 years or so, thinking that they can have a, a reset, thinking that they can have a normalisation. I think it goes for Dave, it goes for, for every, every Prime Minister, uh, thinking that they can turn things around. It certainly went for, uh, for uh, Bill Clinton. Me, and, and what happens is they try, they try, and Russia always lets you down. And it's so sad. Uh, I wanted to, things to go better in our relations with Russia, but when it comes to something like the the scree power poisonings, it's very, very difficult to find any defence or excuse for their behaviour. Using chemical weapons on the streets of a place like Salisbury is absolutely inexcusable. And I, I'm sure that that's what uh, Theresa will have said to, uh, to Vladimir Putin, and she's, she's totally right. Uh, one of the things I was, I was proudest of when I was, when I was Foreign Secretary was actually orchestrating a, uh, a, a global response to what happened in the UK 
and we got a total of 28 countries to kick out 153 Russian diplomats. And that's a, that's a lot when you consider that every country that took that, took that risk was going, to be, was going to face retribution from Putin for doing so. So, so uh, I think that was a, a testimony not just to the, the power of, of, of the UK's influence, but also to the global sense of, of repulsion at the way Russia behaves. A um, couple of questions on Brexit. What's your message to your colleague Dominic Grieve? He says he's going to try and bring government to a halt by using arcane parliamentary procedures yet again uh, to halt government funding for education and welfare benefits. Well, I, I make the same response to Dominic uh, that I'm, uh, who, who I like and admire, who's been an, 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 <coughs> used to be a neighbour of mine uh, when, he was, when I was in Henry. Look, I, I, think, I think people have different views about this question, obviously, but... I think we're coming together now as a party in recognition that we are all basically staring down the barrel of electoral extinction unless we get this thing over the line. And I think that is powerfully concentrating the minds of um, all colleagues in Parliament and indeed colleagues on the Labour benches because, you know, they didn't do that well either. With superhuman incompetence, Jeremy Corbyn actually managed to go backwards in, in the recent council elections. Uh, uh, why? Because, because the public can see that Labour is also failing to help get Brexit done. And they will continue to punish both of us until we do it on October the 31st. But you have Margot James, the digital minister today, in an interview saying that she feels she has more in common with Joe Swinson than she does with you. How well, can you unite you know, the party, I, I, given I, I, those views? I'm very, I'm very proud that one of the, I think, you know, one of the uh, attractions, I would say, and I must, I must, I must fight, fight down my natural humility and bashfulness in, in, in moments like this <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and advertise my, my case to you, I, I command, uh, commanded uh, a couple of weeks ago, much to the surprise of the pundits, the support of, of more than half of the parliamentary party. And I don't think that was what was predicted a, a, a year or so ago, Ian. You know, you, you follow these things incredibly closely, and, and I don't think people would have forecast that result. And, the, and we, our team now has the backing of powerful, strong uh, Remain campaigners, uh, as well as, as leavers, dozens on, on either side. And they're coming together because they want to get this thing done, and then they want to help deliver that modern, conservative, progressive agenda. And, and that's what brings us together. And Margot, of course, is part of that. Can we just clear up this proroguing parliament thing? Because yes. Liz Truss on Newsnight on Wednesday said, absolutely not, Boris Johnson will not prorogue parliament. But you've been slightly more equivocal on that. Do you want to clear that up? Well, I think Liz is right in the sense that I don't want to prorogue parliament. I don't, I'm not attracted to archaic... Uh, Gormenghastian manoeuvres of any kind. That's not what I want to do. That's not the kind of politics I believe in. I, I want to be the Prime Minister of a great representative democracy. And I want, to, I want to confide in the common sense and the maturity of our MPs to get this thing done. And uh, that's going to be my, my approach. But, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, weird devices such as, such as prorogation, I am, I am, I'm certainly not attractive. But you're not gonna, still not going to rule it out? Well, uh, as I think I said last night, uh, you know, uh, there are all sorts of things that uh, remain on the table, but it's a very big and capacious table. I am not, I am not, I am not, let me, let me, you know, just, and I think people will understand where I'm coming from, I am not remotely attracted to that kind of uh, device, that kind of fiat by the executive, uh, when really we should be trusting in our MPs to their common sense to get it done. Um, something on the so-called nanny state, the sugar tax, which is, was brought in by the government. The Sun have got a story saying that Number 10 have now put in a green paper that they want milkshakes to be subject to the sugar tax. <laughs> now, now, whether that's to stop a lot more sort of milkshaking of politicians, yes. I don't know. Um, do, you think, do you think that's to discourage politicians, for people from throwing well, milkshakes at politicians? I wouldn't like I to say, know. but would well. you like to commit now to saving the great British milkshake? Well, look, I... I I, I think, we, we do, look, we've got to be realistic, there, there, is, an, there is an obesity problem in, the, in this country, speaking entirely, entirely personally, uh, it's, you know, it's something, we all, <laughs> it's something we all deal with, we all have to wrestle with, and that we, everybody takes their, 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 has, their, has their various motives, not eating is a very good solution, by the way, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but I, I, what, I, I'm, I'm very, very reluctant to impose new taxes that fall uh, disproportionately on those on low incomes. And I think you, you need to think very, very carefully about you, whether you go down this route. Uh, a, a new tax on, on milkshakes seems to me would clobber those uh, particularly who, you know, who can least 
afford it. And what we should be doing, if we want kids to lose weight, is make the streets safe, as we did in London, by the way, in case I failed to mention it, cut the murder rate by 50%, uh, encourage p kids to walk and cycle to school, which, which will help them uh, to lose weight as well, and generally take more, act, take more exercise and, and be more active. It's calories in, calories out. I think, I think that's, that's vastly, would you withdraw vastly that proposal? preferable. I don't know whether that proposal will, 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 will live long enough to get on the statute book okay. before there is a change of administration. Um, uh, but we, 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 will, we will see. Front page of the Times this morning. Um, stamp duty slashed in Johnson no deal budget. Javid offered Chancellor's job. Gangbusters plan for economy. Ban on new business red tape. Um, expand. Expand. Uh, I, I, look, I, I, think, I think there's already, look, there's, but, I, one of the one of the difficulties I'm I'm discovering in this situation is is obviously that uh, people want to project onto us and onto our, uh, our our agenda all sorts of things that they think are, des are so desirable. So you haven't offered such a chance. They think are desirable, including the possibility that they should be whatever it is. They should have some job or other, and. And that is that well, is. So you're accusing natural. Sajid Javid of placing this? Nobody, no, 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 no. But nobody has. I want to be, want to stress. Nobody has been offered a job, okay. nor would that be. But would stamp be duty? Right. Would you like to see stamp duty slashed, reformed? I've said that before. Uh, I do think. I look. I mean, SDLT, stamp duty, land tax, particularly in uh, in London, uh, is is causing huge problems and freezing the property market. I do think it's. I do think. I don't think it's. I don't think it's got, got the right balance at the moment. And I've said. I've, I'm on record of saying that many, many times. But uh, the, our priority as an incoming government will be to lift the burden on the poorest and neediest in society. And I just remind you what we did in London, where we massively expanded the living wage, which was a really good thing, and was a policy that was nicked by George Osborne in an act of theft I wholly condone, and, and, turned, into, and turned into a national policy, which I think we conservatives should be very, very proud of. We put millions of pounds in the pockets of, of poorer families across this country, and that is the right thing to do. Did you really call the French turds? Well, I, don't, I have no, I have no recollection of this, uh, <laughs> of, of this, uh, of this, this comment. Um, but you know, I, I notice, I notice that um, it is, you know, it is. It's not very well sourced this story, but anyway. Um, well, it seems to have come it? from the Foreign Office. <laughs> what do you read well, into that? Well, Bien je jamais, as we say um, uh, in French. Um, I think, I think. Um, look, the, the, the serious question uh, that perhaps under, underlying all this, and, and, and perhaps what, what everyone will want to know, is: uh, Can I get a fantastic deal from our country, from our French friends? Can we go forwards in a collegiate, uh, friendly way? And yes, of course we can. And I just remind you what we, what we did with the French after the Skripal poisonings, they were fantastic. Uh, we will do a, a great deal uh, with uh, the French, with the Germans, with all our European friends and partners, and then we'll take this thing forward. And I think if I you know, had a criticism of, the, of the, um, what's happened in the last three years, we've both been too defeatist in our approach to negotiations. I don't know whether you agree with that. Uh, we've, been too, we've been too supine. And, and we've sort of, we haven't really stood up. But also, and this is, this is a very important point, we've, we've, we haven't been sufficiently pro-European with a capital E, as it were, as, and setting out what we want from the new partnership and the new rate. This is a, a big opportunity for us. And we want to talk again about bilateral relations. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a sad fact that the teaching of French and German in our schools has massively declined in the 45 years of our EU membership, massively. Uh, people don't, the, the bilateral, when I go to other European capitals, I, I was finding that the bilateral relations uh, in, in those capitals, uh, even in the, the embassies, had been sort of hollowed out. Everything was being done through Brussels. Well, now's our chance to reach out again and to re-engage, not just commercially, but culturally, intellectually, in all sorts of ways. So let's be positive about Europe, but n not just through the institutions of the EU. Here's that final quick-fire question that oh politicians God. always dread. Yeah, Tell us one thing about you that we don't know. Uh, my weight. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, think the last, I think the last time I looked, it's gone up again. Um, to what? It, I think, it's, I think I'm, I'm about 15 and a half again. 15 stone and six. And what were you? 
I was six years and a half, so I've made progress. But so that which is which is the answer to the milkshake question, by the way. <laughs> right. Let's move on to. Uh, is that it? Thank God that for is, that. That okay. is it. Um, let's move on to questions from the audience. I'm going to say who we want first, but I'm also going to say who we want second, so they can indicate for the microphone. So the second question um, will be from Annika Friedland, and the first question from Peter Booth. Where is Peter? Yes. Over here. Good morning, Boris, Good and sir. welcome home to the Great Southwest. Peter Great Booth, Southwest. Yes. Southwest Regional Chairman. At so. the end of this leadership contest, our new leader has to weave our party together into a cloth made of 50 shades of blue. <laughs> Are you the person to do that? Well, I think I, I am. I really do. Thank you, Peter. And listen, just thank you to everybody uh, in the voluntary party who, and the professional party who worked so hard to make a success of conservatism <laughs> in spite of the challenge that we in, in Westminster present to you. And I've got to you know, hold up my hands. You know, we haven't made life easy for, for conservative activists. And, and I want to turn that round. I want to turn that round. And I think actually, even at Westminster, particularly at Westminster, there is a deep yearning now for us to come together and get this thing done. I really think people have had enough of the division. They can see where the threat is, and they can now see where the opportunity is. I mean, the, the threat is clear. It's, it's the Brexit Party and the Lib Dems, both taking advantage of our failure to get this thing done. And the opportunity is also clear. We have, we've n I've never in my lifetime have I known such, a, such an ideologically hopeless uh, opponent in, in Jeremy Corbyn. His, his mystic uh, uh, appeal simply defeats me. I don't understand it. And it obviously defeats many sections of the UK electorate as well, because he is, he is not prospering. We need to capitalize on that. We need to unite our party, unite our country, and take forward a, a modern conservative agenda. And that's what we're going to do. Um, after Annika, we'll go to Fiona Goldsmith. Where is Annika? Oh, right down the front. If Fiona, you can signal where you are for the microphone next time, please. Good morning, Boris. Good morning. Sorry. Since Iran, with whom we have the nuclear treaty, is the, orig is the originator and sponsor of Hezbollah a terrorist organization? Can we trust Iran to allow us full inspection of all urani uranium producing plants in Iran? If so, have sufficient inspections been allowed? Thank you so much. Well, that's a brilliant question. And uh, I think the, 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 the reality is that, uh, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, they, the, 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 the Iranians are currently compliant with the, with the JCPOA. I mean, they are, they are currently not, they are currently what they are with their, their centrifuges and, uh, and yes, they're, they're, they're pushing at the margins, but they are still technically compliant. Yes, does, yes, but yesterday was that the day that not, they, they were supposed to have gone over their enrichment limit. That does it? not mean, that does not mean that they are to be trusted. And we need to be very, very vigilant about Iran and about that government uh, because they are uh, bent on all sorts of mischief in the region. And actually, I think one of the areas where uh, Donald Trump talks sense, and you know, there, are, there are several, by the way, there are many areas where I think, he's, I think, I think I, no, seriously, uh, I, I think it is right for us to work both with the Americans and with our European friends to constrain Iran in the region. But also, and I think, that, and I make this point, think about the Iranian population, and think about their long-term future. This is a young population. It's a dynamic population. Uh, there are high rates of female literacy, uh, high rates of uh, education. They're, they're very tech-savvy. They, they actually want to engage with us, and we should find ways of getting behind, getting over the, 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 the mullah's grip on their society and engaging with young people in Iran. That is the future. And if we can do that, uh, the, the, I, I'm much more optimistic about relations. But for the time being, we have to be incredibly vigilant, and uh, both about uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions, but also uh, about what they're doing to support Hezbollah uh, and, and many, other, uh, many other causes of insecurity in the region, not least terrorism. 
is there any question though that if they do breach this limit, which they said they were going to do yesterday, that we will then firmly side with the Americans? Uh, of course. When, if, if we determine that they are in breach of the JCPOA, then clearly the, the, J, the, the, the okay. joint collective points of agreement on, on uh, Iran's nuclear program, then clearly that, that falls away. And I'm afraid that uh, the American scepticism will have been vindicated, and we will have to draw the consequences. I think that would be very sad for Iran. I, th I would urge them not to go down that track. I would urge them to continue to show restraint. That's the sensible thing. Okay. Um, Fiona Goldsmith, um, and then Mike Allen after that. Where's Fiona? Good morning, Boris. Welcome to the Southwest. Um, the government is spending billions of pounds on the northern powerhouse. What plans do you have to create a southwestern powerhouse to address the yes. imbalance between this area yes. well. and London and, and the southeast? with the sort of investment in infrastructure and transport the north of England are enjoying. Well, I, I quite agree. Thank you very much. And look, I, this is the great southwest, and we should, we should be, we should, I mean, it is time that we had that kind of focus. And uh, in particular, I want to look, as I've said already, at uh, the A303, at uh, road connectivity. I think uh, the A358 springs to mind, uh, somebody who uses that uh, quite a lot, uh, the A38. Uh, there, are, there are things that we should be doing to improve road connectivity, uh, but also there are things we should be doing, be doing with, uh, with, uh, with rail. And um, I just get back to my, my, my key message about full fibre broadband. Every home in this country should have full fibre broadband. We should get on and deliver it. And it is utterly, utterly pathetic. If the Spanish can do it, why can't we? No more manana attitude, I say. <laughs> That's my, so let's get, let's get on. But but we, but you know there's a serious point, which is that you know I think a lot often in, in politics uh, things can take a life of their own and a momentum of their own if there's a if the if there's an agenda that everybody buys into. So with the Northern Powerhouse and with West Midlands, I want to be the the Prime Minister who does for Northern Powerhouse Rail and for connectivity in the in the West Midlands what we were able to do in London with the tube upgrades and Crossrail. You know, we massively expanded people's ability, the ability of people on, on, on modest incomes to get to their place of work quickly and, and conveniently. That's how you increase productivity. It's also socially just. It's socially just to do that. And, and, and the Southwest needs that focus as well. And so I think the, the great Southwest program that is being uh, elaborated now is one that we should, we should develop further and, and support very actively indeed. Yeah. Okay. Mike Allen is next, and following him, Amanda Benham. Mike. Nice to see you, Boris. Good morning, sir. Will you restore ownership of cottage hospitals to the local communities because it's the volunteers who paid for them? And will you ensure that the CCGs and the councils locally rural proof their health and care policies? Well, uh, I can. I, I will. I look. I will. I will thank you. I will look at the the ownership uh, structures very carefully. But I think the crucial thing is to is to make sure that you, we retain good local cottage hospitals and that people uh, have the, that vital service near them. I, I think every MP fights for his uh, or her uh, local provision, and, and particularly for cottage hospitals. I remember doing it in in South Oxfordshire. You've got to do that. And in rural areas, it really counts because, because a half an hour road journey can make all the difference uh, in the quality of care, the certainty, the security people have in their old age. We've, we've got to get it right. So, so I, will, I will certainly support that. Absolutely. Okay. Amanda Benham, followed by Julie Beaumont. Hi, Boris. Um, you've Hi. been avoiding head-to-head -head debates in the words of Mrs. Thatcher, are you frit? I, on, on and if you are frit, are you fit to be Prime Minister? Well, I'm, come on. I, think I've never, I don't think anybody could have done as many hustings uh, as I have done. And one, and one, of, the, one, of, the, one of the important things, and, and indeed encounters in the, in, the, in the media, I think one of the important things is uh, not to, as Conservatives, not to spend too much time 
uh, tearing great lumps out of each other in, the, in advance of uh, the, the end of the project. And, um, if I'm, if I'm, my, 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 my policies and, and so on have, have, have received a, a huge amount of scrutiny. Uh, what, I, what, I w what I will say is uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of a fellow conservative. Uh, that is, that's my general approach to life. But, but you are only doing two head-to-heads with um, Jeremy Hunt. Only? Well, two in a, in a six I mean, or seven week campaign. That here I am. That doesn't strike me as very many. I, here I am talking to the people in the, in the Southwest uh, who are, after all, uh, the electorate, and, and, I didn't, and, and by, your own, uh, by your own admission, I'm doing at least two head-to-head -head debates, which I think is probably more than enough to glut the appetite of the, of uh, the electorate. I, mean, I, I think people... I think I did, I've done loads of debates in my time, loads and loads. And I remember, I remember, I, I did, I did oodles with Ke with Ken Livingston in particular, and it went on and on, night after night. And, and, and yeah, we discovered that people were literally switching off. I mean, they were, they were maybe there's a, a, a there's a growing appetite for this stuff, uh, and uh, and you know they want to screen it prime time. I I think people have got have had quite a lot already. Uh, they're going to hear quite a lot more, and they're going to hear lots of debates, lots of hustings, and be able to make up their minds. Um, right, Julie Beaumont followed by Sally Stevens. <coughs> Morning, Boris. Morning. Um, please, can you tell me what your policy is on tackling illegal immigration? Illegal immigration. Well, I when it's illegal, uh, people should face the consequences of what they do uh, in, in law, and uh, we should be catching them, and we should be, I'm afraid, we should be sending them back. Um, that, is the, that is the way to, to do it. I don't, don't wish to sound inhumane uh, because I'm generally quite pro-immigration by talented people and always, always have been. But if they're breaking the law, then, then clearly that, that, is a, that is another matter. And uh, I think as a country, we've had spent a long time where we've, where we've allowed um, a, a lot of very, very experienced and clever lawyers to uh, interrupt the process of, uh, of return uh, so, so that it, it becomes very, very difficult to send people back to, to, to whence they came, with the result that more people come, and it's a, it's a very serious, very, very serious problem. So um, I would be, my, my general approach would be tough on illegal, uh, but making sure that we remain an open economy to talent. And I, I must be very clear about that. I, I, I don't want to slam the, the, the gates of of Britain to everybody, and I speak as somebody who's, you know, whose great grandfather. I might seem to my father there in the front row. Uh, my, my great grandfather came here in fear of his life from Turkey, and and you know, if he, and if Britain hadn't then been an open and welcoming country, um, well, I don't know, he would he would have probably been assassinated slightly earlier than, earlier than he was. Uh, so so you know, um, what 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 about people who aren't necessarily necessarily highly talented? Because we know that a lot in the rural economy, the rural economy li relies a lot on uh, immigrant labour, seasonal labour. That's right. And that's why you need an Australian-style points-based system to sort it out. What you, what you need is a... It, you, you, there, are, there is no doubt. Our economy is, is a fantastic, diverse, growing economy. And there are sect, there, the, if you look at the, the rural sector, there are unquestionably uh, farming communities uh, that do need seasonal labour. Uh, and, and it's gone on for, for, for decades, if not for centuries. And uh, I remember on, on, on our farm in Somerset, there would, there would be, there would be uh, people who came over from... Uh, say again? Withypool. Withypool, that's right. Not from Withypool. <laughs> they, they didn't come just from Withypool. <laughs> they, 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 came, they came from France or from Switzerland or, or, or wherever uh, on, a, on a seasonal basis. And that's, that's, in, that's entirely right. And uh, you should, but you should do it according to the needs of the of the economy. You should do it according to the needs of the of the sector. And I think what has gone wrong with the current approach is there's been no control at all, and, and nobody's known on what basis people were coming in, and they, they were able to come with no jobs to go to, and no sense that their their particular skill was actually required by the UK economy. So once you have control of your immigration system, and you have a points-based approach, I think the most important thing you, you then have is democratic consent for what is going on. And that was, that was, in very large measure, what the Brexit vote was all about. People just didn't feel they were being consulted, or they didn't feel that their elected politicians were in charge. Well, now, 
we're going to be in charge and we'll have a system that actually reflects the needs of the UK economy. And, and, and you know, we don't just have people coming in without jobs to go to. You're quite liberal on immigration, I though, am. generally, aren't you? I, am. And the, the, I saw on Twitter, so it must be true, the other day, <laughs> <laughs> the, the other day that um, when you were Foreign Secretary, you met a lot of European ambassadors and you said to them that actually you didn't have a particular problem with freedom of movement. No, that's completely untrue. That was, that was a... That was not true. That was a, that, I remember that was a, a breakfast meeting, briefing that, that I did uh, with them, and uh, they produced an, a, a, a wholly distorted account of what I had said. I do. I think free, I, a, 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 a fallacious account. I do think freedom of movement does not work because it is uh, there's no control. You have you know what's the population of the EU? 580 million uh, people who are technically allowed to to come and go as they please to treat the UK as it were, as their own, as their own country. And I, and, I, and I just don't think that was working for us anymore. We need to have a system. Yes, we can be open. Yes, we can be generous. Yes, we can be uh, welcoming of talent. But it needs to be democratically controlled. And that's what we're offering, and that's the way forward. Right, Sally Stevens followed by Steve Smith. Uh, which failings, as, as a minister, can you learn from the most as PM? Well, uh, <laughs> boy, I think I think and I, I've mentioned I mentioned my my disappointment over over Skripal, and I mean I think that probably is the single thing I remember. I I, I I I was I really thought that it was possible to eyeball the Russians and to get a new relationship, and it, I was very optimistic. I went to Moscow actually in sort of in defiance of of a lot of advice. I tried to. Uh, B build a new uh, friendship and a, and a new partnership, and it just it just isn't there. There's you know the, all this stuff that Putin comes up with about you know uh, liberalism is over. He's wrong. He's totally wrong. Our values: freedom, democracy, the rule of law, free speech. Those things are imperishable, and they will succeed. And, I, it was, and I, I just thought, I believe that so strongly, that I thought it must be obvious to the Russians. And in the end, it wasn't. And we've, we're just going to have to wait and, and, and recognize that, again, as with Iran, you know, Putin is not Russia. There's a young generation of Russians who are going to want to listen to a, a new message and who are going to want to engage in a different way. And that's where we should be focusing. That's where British diplomacy should be focusing as well. Is it, is it possible to be idealistic in terms of foreign policy? Or were, were you constantly yes. confronted by harsh realities? No, I think it, it's not only possible, it's absolutely essential. People in this country have no idea how much we are loved and valued around the world for what we do and for, for our values. So there are people, in, even if they're not in power, there are people in politics around the world who look to the UK, who listen to what we have to say, whether it's about female education, or about human rights, or free speech, and think, well, at least somebody's sticking up for these things. Somebody understands what I'm campaigning for and what I believe in. And it is incredibly important that we, that we do it. So, and, you know, and, and I know that people say we shouldn't be spending so much on, on overseas aid, and, you know, I'll, you know, a controversy you haven't even asked about, but I'll wade into. Uh, yeah, I think that some of it probably could be much, much better spent, and I'd like to see it spent uh, delivering British political commercial objectives, but it, it delivers massive results around the world, and we should be very, very proud of the good the UK does. And I think it would be a very sad day if we were to seem, be seen to retreat from our global engagement. And that is not what Brexit is about, is it? No. Brexit is about producing a global Britain and not a, a narrow uh, narrow, uh, what's the word, introverted uh, approach to life. That so won't work. Since you waded into that, just very quickly, 0.7% on international yeah. aid, you're, you're committed to I, I, that? I am. I, I, will, I, will, I will defend that if and only if we use that funding to promote our commercial, uh, diplomatic and political objectives as well. And that seems to be only reasonable. Other countries do that. Uh, I was, it was incredibly frustrating to be in, I think, uh, in, in, in Myanmar and to, and to, and to, and to find that the, the Japanese were beating us hollow when it came to 
uh, getting contracts for, for railways because they were prepared to underwrite uh, their exports and, and their companies in a way that, that, that we weren't. And I would like to see us being much more proactive in supporting British business abroad and being much more dynamic in, in our approach. Okay. We've got 10 minutes left, and I've got five questions here, so let's see if we can do two minutes a question. Um, Steve Smith, followed by David Do you want me Kerr. to pad it out to two minutes, or do you want me to... Do you want, we could have some more questions if you want. We could. Let's see if we can get through. All right. Morning, Boris. How will you run your government? Sofas or boardroom? It will be a team. Uh, and it will, be, it, will be drawn, it will be a very widely drawn team. I don't know whether it will meet in... A, it, does, it doesn't matter where it meets, but there, there, there is a... Uh, as I say, a big uh, constellation of talent available now in the Conservative Party. I don't think I've ever known a time when the Tory party had so many brilliant men and women in Parliament. Uh, we will draw from all uh, sections of the, of the party to take us forward. And uh, I would remind you the way I ran City Hall, it was with a fantastic team of deputy mayors, many of whom were women, of course, and I believe passionately in advancing uh, that agenda as well. Would you commit to 50% of your cabinet being made The difficulty with that, Ian, is that um, we don't have 50% representation of, of women in, in, the, in the Conservative parliamentary group, and I think that would be invidious uh, at the moment. All right, well, but, what about the 30% 30, 30 as it is in the parliamentary party? Well, uh, I think it would... You know, I'm not going to give some quota at the moment, but we should definitely be advancing, definitely be advancing the interests of women in Parliament and in government. And if you, if you want to look at how I do it, look at my team in City Hall, because it was virtually a sort of, you know, feminocracy. It was, it was, it worked, <laughs> and it worked well. But it, it, is your instinct, though, I, I mean, you, you're quite an informal person. Is your instinct to sit someone down on a sofa or sit across the cabinet table from them and be a bit more formal? I think this is the most trivial question I've been asked for. I, mean, I, mean, uh, I think... I do it for I, a living. No, I understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I think it probably def depends on what kind of conversation it is going to be <laughs> and whether there is going to be coffee or not. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, it's, that's OK, let's move on. Um, David Kerr, a very different question, this. And then Peter Walsh after David. Morning, Boris. Morning. I think you might have par partly answered this question already, but given the large amount of working people using food banks, would you divert overseas aid budget or part of it to help them? Well, I, I, look, I, I, I understand people's strong, strong feelings about this. I, I think people who help run food banks are wonderful. When I was running London, we did, I, I helped set up loads of food banks, and they're fantastic things. Uh, and the answer is, of course, to make sure that people on lower incomes get more in their packets, their pay packets, every week. And that's why I, I championed the living wage and expanded it so much. The country as a whole particularly people on, on low incomes, need a pay rise. We're totally honest with you. We, we need higher pay, not higher taxes. That should be, that should be our, our approach. And it, you can do it. You can do it. And the way to do it is not just through things like the, the living wage. It's through, it's through better skills, higher productivity, all the stuff we've been talking about earlier on, about investment in transport infrastructure and, and broadband. All those things will help to drive up uh, investment and drive up uh, incomes as well. That is, that is what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, higher pay uh, for, for those on uh, lower incomes is, is crucial. That's why I think it was in the Times piece this, this morning. I, I said, I've said what I said about lifting thresholds uh, for national insurance uh, for those on low pay as well. We've got to do that. Too okay. many people on, on very small incomes are paying too much in tax. It's simply not right. Peter Walsh followed by Gillian Whitelaw. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, bearing in mind the quality of the two candidates, will whoever is successful bring the other into their cabinet? And if well. losing, what position would they like? <laughs> well, I, again, I, mean, I think this is one of those very, very difficult and invidious questions because, uh, y y of course, um, there's a, there is a wealth of, of, of talent on the, on the Conservative benches, but anything I say now uh, about uh, the future shape or, or, or personnel of... Uh, of, of the administration I lead would, would be counted as measuring the curtains. 
and um, I just don't think we're yet in that position. But Although I, 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 I hope fervently to count on your support and to get over the line, I just, I just think you know, there's a long way to go. But it would be normal for the winner to um, put the second place candidate into their cabinet, wouldn't it? I mean, that's always happened before. Uh, it, not with Dave and DD, as far as I can remember. Um, <laughs> but well, that was a bit slightly different circumstance. He put him in okay. the shadow cabinet. Did he? Yes, Shadow Home Secretary. I mean, you're right. I worked for him. I you're know. right. You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, okay. Well, perhaps I could just cut to the chase by saying by saying I have a very very high regard for Jeremy. And but you're um, not going to guarantee him a job. I'm not guarantee. Well, okay. I'm not. I, All right. I, let's I, move on. I, I, I know. I, well, what I will say is is that your 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 previous comment, which in your 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 analysis, which are, which in your, you're right. It sounds to me. Uh, eminently fair and, 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 and logical, but I am not making commitments to anybody. You nearly got there. But I'm not making commitments to anybody because you would not expect that. Okay. I will ask that to Jeremy as well. Um, Gillian Whitelaw followed by Keith Cottrell. Uh, Gillian. Uh, good morning, Boris. Given the emergency, the two emergency loans totaling £6.2 billion, pounds, generously made by the Treasury to Ireland after the 2008-9 banking collapse, has the Irish PM been asked to repay the loan in the light of continuing intransigence over the backstop? Well... <laughs> I, 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 I don't believe that uh, that issue has been raised. Uh, but I, I, want to, look, I want to say it is very, very important that we get this right with our friends in, in Dublin. And, of course, uh, we've got to be sensitive about the issue of the, of the Northern Irish border. But I, I would just say to you that I think it can be done. And I think what it needs is a, a, bit, of, uh, a, a bit of confidence. And uh, we need to look at the technical solutions that all sides agree are practicable and deliver them in the context of the, the free trade agreement. And we will engage uh, absolutely uh, generously and openly with our friends and partners in, in, in Dublin. Uh, I, I, we won't be using that kind of tool of uh, negotiation because I, I, we want, I hold out the hand of, of friendship. And I, see, and I, and I recognize how important, uh, how important getting it right is for, for Leo, for Agka, and, and for Dublin. We will be very, very consensual. We will work with them. But what is absolutely non-negotiable, we will not have, we will not have, under any circumstances, a hard border in Northern Ireland. We will not have checks at that border. And the whole of the UK will come out of the EU entire and united without in any way prejudicing the government of Northern Ireland. And we will get it done. And it will be a, a great success. And we can work with our... Uh, with our friends and partners in Dublin to do it. Now, if you answer this next question in less than two and a half minutes, shall we take our life into our hands and take a spontaneous one? Yeah, of course. We should take any number of spontaneous right. questions. Right, Keith. Good morning. Yes. Are you committed to ensure that all animal welfare legislation, as it currently stands in the EU, will become law in the UK post-Brexit? Uh, yes, I am, Keith, and I would go further and say that leaving the EU will actually give us the opportunity to uh, intensify some protections. And I would, I would point out, uh, for instance, uh, live transport of, of animals to the continent, uh, where, we can, where we can do more, and, and we should. Uh, there, there may, and, and, and there may be other things uh, as well. Uh, there are areas where, actually, I think the spirit and feeling of, of, the, of the British people is very, uh, animal sentience, for instance. The spirit and feeling of the British people is very much in favor of protecting animals and protecting animal welfare, where there are sensible things that we can do, uh, then that, that go beyond uh, the current framework, then, then, we, then we should do them. Right, who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Gentlemen, yeah, right. One in the front row, if we can get a microphone here. And let's have someone over this side, because I think you've been a bit neglected. A chap in the front row here. Hello, Boris. Thank Sir. you. No, uh, no, it's an absolute pleasure to hear the Come on, get on with it. message. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Huawei, uh, will you commit Huawei. to looking again at Huawei, Huawei. and standing yep. firm with our US and Five Eyes partners and saying no to Huawei in our security network? Well, uh, I'm very, very dubious about anything that compromises our security 
you know, I, obviously, I don't want to pitchfork away investment in our country. And I, I've been a help to attract a, a lot of investment from China, from India, around the world into, into the UK. And I'm very, very proud of it. But you can't, uh, and, and it may be, it may even be, that there are useful things that can be done in infrastructure. The Chinese, as you know, are uh, heavily in, are committed to, to Hinckley. You know, uh, we, we've done that. But, as you rightly say, we should not be doing anything that will deter uh, cooperation with our most valuable intelligence partners, the Five Eyes. Uh, that's where, uh, and, I, and I really saw this as, as Foreign Secretary, but uh, with responsibility for the, uh, the agencies. You know, this is an unbelievable relationship. Uh, we cannot afford to put it at risk. Right, final question over here. Would you be for or against extending the franchise to 16-year-olds? Giving the vote to 16-year-olds. Yeah. How old are you, sir? <laughs> 17. 17, right, okay, okay, right, right. Well, you've only, got a, <laughs> you've only got a year. You've only got a year. But you're allowed to vote in this thing, aren't you? Can you? Yes. Yeah, well, there you go. I think. I think. Is, I don't know what the rules are. Can you vote in this? Can you vote in this? Can, this? Fantastic. Okay, well, I'm not going to... Okay, well, that, well, look, I mean, that, that's a start. <laughs> that, seems, that seems to me, that seems to me, that, you know, a, 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 there, are, you know a, there are a lot of people who can't vote in this contest who would like to vote in this contest. Uh, so congratulations uh, on that, uh, on your foresight in becoming a, a member of our party at this crucial time. Um, <laughs> I, I am, I am, I am uh, and, and let's encourage many more people to join, by the way, uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a great party and a great time to join. But I tell you what, I'm, I'm not that attracted to, to reducing the, uh, the age of the, of, of the franchise just because I want, I, want, I want people to value their votes. And uh, I think that, you know, 18, year, 18 years, um, you know, we don't get enough 18 to 24 year olds voting, uh, let alone 16 year olds voting. I'd like to see the 18 to 24 year olds really using their vote before we, 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 we lower the franchise downwards. Let's, let's value our franchise first, and let's, enc let's encourage people out to the polls uh, whenever they come. And in case I forgot to mention it earlier, uh, they're not going to come anytime soon if I'm lucky enough to be uh, successful. We don't want an early election. We, what we want to do, we want to get Brexit done uh, by October the 31st. We want to unite our party, uh, unite under a fantastic, progressive, modern, conservative agenda, and then, in due course, in the fullness and richness of time, we are going to wallop Jeremy Corbyn for six. That's what we're going to do. So, so, basically, you're going to wait for an election to allow this young gentleman to vote. That's the message. I, my, uh, my intention, sir, is that you should be able to vote in the next general election <laughs> by, some, by, by, by some way. Right. The gentleman is determined to ask a question, but we've gone two and a half minutes over our time. I will give Jeremy Hunt the two and a half minutes as well, because that's uh, obviously fair. Uh, Boris Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll just have a couple of minutes before we reset things and then we'll come back. But don't rush to the loo because it will only be two minutes.
What's your surname? Dale. Right, ladies and gentlemen, if you could resume your seats, please. We're about to get underway again. Please retake your seats, or they will be removed. Um, I have had a complaint, ladies and gentlemen, that I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. It, it's because I'm so self-effacing, you see. Um, my name's Ian Dale. I host the evening show on LBC Radio and do sort of news night. Basically, I'm a gob on a stick on politics. So that's why they've got me to do this, because I interview people for a living. So let me, without further ado, introduce you to contestant number two, Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> Come on, on your feet. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, 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 hi. Thank you, thank you. Right. Welcome. Ian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be in Devon. I uh, lived here for two years when my dad was posted with the Navy to Dartmouth. And you Devonians can answer a question that has been troubling me for my whole life, which is if you come and live here for two years, do you count as a local or as a grockle? <laughs> Put up your hands if it's a local. <laughs> Well, as a very happy grockle, uh, we had two wonderful years. In fact, I'm with my sister, who, uh, who's here today, and we had a fantastic time here. Um, and this is really one of the best places in the country with the coast, Dartmoor, Exmoor. You've got everything, and it's wonderful to be here. And friends, we are in a very serious situation for our country. If we get things wrong... There will be no Conservative government, no Brexit, no Conservative party even. But get things right, and we can deliver Brexit, unite our party, unleash the incredible potential of our country, and send Corbyn packing. Now, if you choose me, I'll be the first Prime Minister we've had who has a background as an entrepreneur. How many people here set up their own business? Just put up your hand if you... That's why we know this is a conservative event, don't we? It's, that is the lifeblood of our party. And what is it that entrepreneurs do? Every day, we negotiate. And what are the golden rules of negotiation? First of all, you have to be prepared to walk away if you can't get the deal you want. And secondly, you have to figure out what the other guys are going to do. And at the moment, unfortunately, we've got Parliament trying to block no deal and a no deal Brexit as an option. So the quickest way to leave the European Union is to send someone to Brussels who can negotiate a deal that can get through Parliament. And that's what I'm going to do because as Foreign Secretary, when I go around the world, people look at me and they say, you're one of the oldest democracies in the world. Are you really going to do this Brexit thing? And I say to them, yes, we are. Because in this country, people tell politicians what to do, and it's not politicians telling people what to do. And that's why we're going to deliver Brexit and make it a huge success. <laughs> and then when we do, like many people here, as someone who set up their own show, I want to fire up the British economy. You know, we could be the fastest growing, most pro-enterprise, pro-business, high-tech economy in Europe or even the world. And I want to do that by taking our top universities, and you've got Bristol, Exeter, Plymouth, fantastic universities, our technology entrepreneurs, and turning us into the world's next Silicon Valley. 
And why do I want to do that? Because right at this moment in our history, I want to park an economic jumbo jet on Europe's doorstep so that in those trade negotiations, they need us every bit as much as we need them. And then, as Conservatives, we need to have not just an economic mission, but also a social mission. Now, for me, for a long time, that was the NHS. And in the audience today, we've got two very special people. Where are Scott and Sue Morris? Are they? They're sitting over there. Scott and Sue Morris. They came and saw me. They asked to come and see me. I didn't know them from Adam, uh, just a few months into being health secretary. And they told me the terrible story of how they lost their son Sam to sepsis when he was just three years old. And the NHS normally does such a fantastic job. But in this case, when they raised those concerns, they said the shutters came down, no one wanted to meet them, talk to them. And that was probably the moment when I realized that the culture in the NHS needed to change. And I had my battles there. But after nearly six years, we had nearly three million more patients using good or outstanding hospitals. And if anyone deserves the credit for that, it's people like Scott and Sue and patients who campaigned to change the NHS. And let's just give them a big round of applause for what they did. But you know, in the end, politics is about winning elections. And I'd be the first prime minister in half a century who has won a marginal seat. I know what it's like to knock on every single door, need every single vote. I'm looking at every single vote right now. <laughs> I love you all. <laughs> and um, I, I want to make two promises. As your prime minister, before we go into an election, I promise that we will get more young people to vote Conservative. Because, you know, we, we are the party of aspiration. And we can't be that party of aspiration if the most aspirational people in our country aren't supporting us. So we have got to get young people on board. And there's something else that I commit. And that is that I will not provoke an election before we have left the European Union. You cannot go back and ask, you can't go back and ask for another mandate until we've delivered the mandate that we got last time, and that's what we're going to do. And if we ignore that, we ignore the lesson of Peterborough when we were squeezed by the Brexit party on the right, the Lib Dems on the left, and Labour came through the middle. Ignore that basic truth, and we ignore the crocodile lurking under the surface of British politics, which is a Labour party led by the most ruthless, dangerous, anti-Western, anti-British, hard-left cabal that we've ever seen in British politics under Jeremy Corbyn. And we must not let them do that. So, faced with a hard-left populist like Jeremy Corbyn, we could choose our own populist, or we could do better. We could choose our own Jeremy. And this, and this Jeremy is going to win the argument for enterprise, aspiration, for true social justice. Not so much social justice for the people in this room. Most of us have done OK in our lives. But social justice for young people desperate to find a decently paid job, for families desperate to buy a home, for older people who just want to live out their days in dignity and respect. That is who the Conservative Party is for. We're going to deliver Brexit, unleash our potential, look after those people. Let me show you how. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Jeremy, you're missing out on the G20 by being in Devon. I don't know how much of a regret that is. But um, Theresa May has uh, met Vladimir Putin this morning. If you were with her, what would you be saying to Vladimir Putin? And do you think it's possible to rebuild relations with Russia? Well, it's possible to rebuild relations um, if Russia changes its behavior. But last year, 
Russia used chemical weapons on British soil in Salisbury, leading to the death of a British citizen. And my worry about Russia is that they're up to their old tricks. And, uh, you know, my dad was in the Navy, and thanks to that generation, we won the Cold War because they never took peace for granted. And that's why I said that I will increase the proportion of our GDP that we spend on defence. Because at the point of Brexit, I want people like Vladimir Putin to know that Britain, the country that has always stood up for democratic values, always understood the security necessary to protect those values. At the point of Brexit, Britain is here, Britain's back, and our voice is going to be strong. How much would you increase defence, Sonia Because there's been a lot of spending commitments being flying around from both candidates in this leadership election race, and at some point, one of you is going to have to deliver on them. Mm. Indeed, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> and uh, look, I, I've said that I will increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP over five years, which means that it would go up uh, by 15 billion by uh, the end of the next five year period. Uh, that is still less, by the way, as a proportion of GDP than we were spending in the 1990s. But I look around the world today, and uh, we don't have the Cold War, but we have. Russia doing things that, uh, that we hope they wouldn't be doing. We also have the rise of China. And I think that this is a period when we have to recognize that our democratic systems, our open societies, the, thing that we, the things that we treasure the most are not things that we can ever take for granted. So I recognize that this is a bigger call on taxpayers, but I think it's the right thing to do for our country, and I think it says the right thing about our country that we're prepared to stand by our values. Um, <clears throat> switch to Brexit. Can you confirm that the current withdrawal agreement will not be put before Parliament again if you become Prime Minister? Yes. Good. <laughs> I like answers like that because we can get more questions in then. Um, if October the 31st isn't your absolute deadline for leaving the EU, what is? You say it doesn't matter if it's delayed by a few days or a week or so, but how many weeks? Look, Boris and my position on this is not actually very different. We both want to get out by the 31st of October. I have said that if there's a deal in sight and we're still getting it through Parliament in, in the week running up to the 31st of October and we haven't quite got the bill through Parliament but we have a deal, uh, then I'm not going to rip the whole thing up um, and, uh, and leave because I think a deal would be better for businesses, it would be better for the union um, and so you know, I would like to get a deal if we could. But if we get to the beginning of October and we don't have a deal in sight, something that can get through the House of Commons so it's not going to have the backstoppers as it stands now, um, providing Parliament hasn't taken it off the table, I'll be out because we have to implement that democratic mandate. Um, it is a fundamental point in this democracy of ours, which is so respected all over the world, that people know that politicians do what we're told to do, even when the political class as a whole didn't want to do Brexit. It's a very, very important signal. So um, I would absolutely be prepared to leave without a deal if there isn't one in sight, and uh, I think we'll know that pretty soon. But what, what does that mean, though? Because if you don't commit, as Boris Johnson has, to the 31st of October as a hard deadline, in, people suspect that you might be prepared to go to uh, November the 30th, December the 31st, and, and kick the can down the road in the same way that it has been kicked down the road over the past three years. Well, I'm not, because I think we will all know, you will know, I will know, if there is a deal in sight at the beginning of October. But, but if you make it an absolute hard deadline and then Parliament stops you, then you have to have a general election to change Parliament. And I won't do that because I think that it doesn't matter who our leader is, uh, we would be crucified if we have an election before we have left the European Union. And I think we would find if we did that, we were risking having Corbyn in Downing Street. And you know, if you have Corbyn in Downing Street, the one thing that is never going to happen is Brexit because the Labour Party will never allow Corbyn to leave the European Union. And I'm here because, as a Democrat, I want to deliver Brexit. I know we can't do anything else in our country until we have resolved the Brexit issue. And as a negotiator, 
someone who can do deals, I think I'm the best place to deliver that deal, bring it home, and uh, allow us to get on with all those other brilliant things that we want to do for the country. Come on to those in a minute. Um, you signed off on Theresa May's checkers plan. You signed up to the withdrawal agreement with the backstop. You supported her in the cross-party talks, therefore legi legitimising Jeremy Corbyn. You signed up to her effectively offering a customs union. Why should any Leave voter trust you? Because um, we have collective responsibility and you know, I always believed that Theresa May was trying her best and I should be a loyal foreign secretary to a prime minister that had a very, very challenging job. But as you know, it doesn't mean that at every stage you agree with the decisions being taken. I, I personally did not agree with the decision to accept the backstop. I wanted to negotiate harder and get it changed and I didn't think that it would get through Parliament. But I'm not going to undermine my Prime Minister in those situations because, sincerely, I wish that we had voted that deal through because we'd be out of the European Union by now and we'd be in a situation. But we are where we are and now we need to negotiate a deal, a better deal, a deal that can get through Parliament. And you know, to do that, we have to send someone to Brussels that they're prepared to negotiate with, they're prepared to do a deal with. I don't say it's going to be easy. But it's not impossible. And our country has done much, much more difficult things in our history in the past. And we can make this happen. We can get that deal. Uh, we're going to have to be tough. Um, and they'll tell us now, as they're telling us every day, we won't budge and it's this deal or, or no deal. They'll say all those things. But in the end, they want to do a deal. And if we approach this in the right way, we can get a deal. If we approach this in the wrong way, we could trip ourselves into an election and lose the whole thing. And that's why I think we have to get this absolutely right in the next few weeks. Um, I saw a picture of you in one of the papers the other day where you were buying a milkshake. Um, now, in the, sun, in the Sun this morning, there's a story that says that Jamie Oliver has persuaded Number 10 to insert a new clause into, the white pa into a white paper on childhood obesity to, bring in a, uh, to extend the sugar tax to milkshakes. Do you think Jamie Oliver should mind what's left of his business? <laughs> um, well, I've got, I'm going to tell you a secret. I was health secretary for um, six years. Nearly, no, that wasn't. I'm coming on to it now. Um, uh, also, I was an entrepreneur. Did you know that? was another secret. Yeah. Um, but you weren't the son uh, of a bus driver. <laughs> um, but uh, I, um, I spent six years um, trying not to go into McDonald's because uh, uh, people wouldn't approve of the health secretary going to McDonald's. But I did once go in to get some Happy Meals for my kids and the staff were so delighted they asked to take a photograph with me, which, uh, uh, which obviously meant the secret was out. But um, uh, I, do li I like my milkshakes. Um, the way to solve this problem, we do need uh, to tackle our obesity crisis. We have the second worst obesity levels in Europe and it is uh, something that disproportionately affects people from poorer families. But the quickest way to deal with this crisis is for the people who manufacture milkshakes and other products to reduce the levels of sugar in those products so that uh, the taste doesn't change very much, but they're much healthier. So I think you threaten them. You say, look, we'd be prepared to legislate if you won't play ball. But my experience is if you make that threat, uh, you don't actually need to follow through with um, the dreaded milkshake tax, and that's what I do. Um, final question from me. I, I said I would ask you this on Saturday, but didn't, so here goes. How, how important is character in people making their decisions as to who to vote for in this contest? Are politicians' private lives up for grabs? I don't think... I, of course character matters, because all of you are making a judgment on how, as Prime Minister, me or Boris is going to... Uh, handle those meetings with Vladimir Putin, uh, the negotiations with the EU, and, and character is part of that. But private life should not be part of that because, you know, we all have things in our private life, uh, things that we did 20 years ago that we wouldn't want our mum and dad oh, to you? find out about. I've got lots, and I'm not going to tell you, Ian, sorry. Um, <laughs> and my wife's sitting in the front row, so that's another reason. Sorry, I'll um, ask her later. <laughs> um, she doesn't know them. Um, <laughs> Um, so um, I'm, I, I think when we are in a constitutional crisis, frankly, the biggest 
constitutional crisis of my lifetime. It demeans that competition if we start having huge discussions about people's private lives. And I think we should stick to the issues facing the country. Right, well, let's do that now. We've got a couple of extra minutes for questions because we ran over a little bit with Boris, so um, we can get a lot more in. Um, Helen Millman is the first question, followed by Anthony Starkey. Helen. Hello. Uh, you talked about being the party of aspiration. Would you abolish inheritance tax and capital gains tax? Well, um, Just say I, yes. I'd like to abolish... <laughs> Go on, will you vote for me if I say yes? <laughs> um, look, it's a, I would like to reduce lots of taxes. Um, and, you know, inheritance tax is one of the most unfair taxes because people have worked hard all their lives, they've saved up. And one of the reasons you save up is to pass things on to your children. And so, uh, as Conservatives, we worry that inheritance tax discourages people from saving and doing the right thing. Um, but what I would say is that my priority when it comes to tax cuts are the things that are going to fire up our economy. So I've said I will do a very, very radical cut to corporation tax to the levels they have in the Republic of Ireland uh, down to 12.5%. That's much less of a vote winner than an inheritance tax cut. Uh, I accept that. But our economy is growing at 1.5% a year. In America, it's going at 3% a year. If we could boost our growth rate, just as Trump has done with his business tax cuts, if we got it up to American levels, that alone would be an extra 20 billion pounds to spend on tax cuts, maybe an inheritance tax cut, or money for our public services like the NHS or the social care system. So the focus, I think, of a conservative government has to start by firing up the economy and then you can ta start to tackle all those other things. What, what do you feel in your gut is the most unfair tax that people have to pay in this country? Well, I think, um, I, I think if you're talking about personal taxation, mm. um, as a businessman, I'll, I'll say, as a businessman, you know, I think business rates are absolutely crippling. And I... <laughs> And I have uh, found money within the headroom we have to take 90% of high street uh, businesses out of business rates. And the reason I want to do that is because they are really suffering from the online revolution. And I want them help, to help them reinvent their businesses and I want our high streets to be thriving. Um, but on a personal level, and this is not a, a commitment to something I would do right away because we don't have the money to do this right away, but it's something that I would like to do in due course. I think that everyone in this country should be able to earn a thousand pounds a month without paying any tax or national insurance. I think that as conservatives we should understand that life is very expensive now. The rent is very, very expensive in our cities and uh, we should support people just starting out by reducing that tax on the, the lowest paid. So that, that would effectively bring the national insurance um, level up to the personal tax threshold? Correct. All right. um, <laughs> Anthony Starkey, followed by Patricia White. Anthony. Um, imagine it's uh, November the 1st, Independence Day plus one. Do you think, could you turn your attention to the rail network in the southwest, which is a barrier to economic development? You hear of the Northern Pacific first, Independence Day plus one. Do you think, could you turn your attention to the rail network in the southwest, which is a, uh, your policy on HS2? Oh, you slipped that one in, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Look, the point, Anthony, of Brexit is a point when we have to show confidence to the world about our country. And that means sorting out our infrastructure, which I think has trailed other developed countries for far too long. <coughs> I lived in Japan for a couple of years uh, in my 20s. Sure it wasn't China? I have been known to muddle this up in. Um, I think that was a low shot, don't you? <laughs> that was, you That's know. Right. I'll do uh, one to Boris on with in Carlisle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, um, they built their high speed rail between Tokyo and Osaka in 1964. That was two years before I was born. 
we're going to open HS2 in 2026. Now, it's going to be fantastic, but that is way too long. So, yes, I'm committed to HS2. Yes, I'm committed to Northern Powerhouse Rail. And yes, I do think that the train service to Devon and Cornwall is totally inadequate. Um, I think that, uh, I know we've got the electrification program uh, to Cardiff, but um, I would like to see it going beyond that to Bristol. I'd like to see a much faster, smoother train service uh, to the West Country, yes, because that is the foundation of prosperity. And as Conservatives, people know <coughs> that we're the only party that understands how to create wealth. But sometimes they don't know about our commitment to spread that wealth throughout the whole country. And we can't just be the party of London and, and the South East. We've got to be the party of everywhere. Uh, Patricia White, followed by Toby Shirazian. Uh, Patricia. Thank you. Good morning, Jeremy. At the 2015 general election... Could you hold the microphone closer to your Sorry. mouth? At the 2015 general election, the South West won you 52 out of its 55 seats. What are you going to do to help us win the ones we lost at the 2017 election? Well, good. Thank did you, you, did you all hear that? Um, I, look, Patricia made the point that we would not have had a Conservative government after 2015 if it wasn't for the extraordinary performance in winning seats in the South West. And uh, the best thing about that was that we kicked out so many Lib Dems. Uh, <laughs> And um, I am someone who has, a, I'm afraid, a total aversion to Lib Dems because my own parliamentary seat, they came within 861 votes of winning it off us when I became the prospective parliamentary candidate. And I had a life or death battle for two and a half years. Um, and I know what it's like. And I'm afraid they are often very dirty campaigners. Um, and uh, and I, I support people in Exeter who are trying to get this back to being a Conservative-held city because we want a Conservative MP in Exeter. Um, so the answer to your question is uh, two things. First of all, we've got to deliver Brexit, but we've got to deliver Brexit in a way that reassures people on the centre ground of politics that it's not changed the fundamental character of our country, that we're still an open, outward-looking, internationally-minded country, which we're going to be under a conservative Brexit. Um, and secondly, we've got to be campaigners. In every seat that we are targeting, we've got to out Lib Dem the Lib Dems, we've got to be focused on local issues. And you know, we've got some brilliant MPs in Devon and Cornwall, and our incredible success actually in Cornwall our success uh, in getting MPs elected is an inspiration to how actually when it comes to local services, local hospitals, buses, it's Conservatives that bring home the goods. <coughs> um, after Toby Shirazi and David Trezies, uh, Toby. Good afternoon, Jeremy. Uh, I pay £9,250 a year for my university tuition and I only eight hours of contact time a week. Are you committed to ensuring that universities provide value for money? And if so, how would you intend to do this? Well, um, Toby, I support our tuition fee reforms uh, because we have the best universities in Europe. In fact, we've got three of the top ten universities in the world in our country. Uh, we attract students from all over the world who come and study here. One of them was my wife, actually. Um, and uh, so we are very, very lucky to have a strong university sector. I do worry that some of the courses that we offer um, do not give students value for money. Because if you're going to end up your, um, your degree with 50, 60 grand of debt, and you've got absolutely no prospect of earning enough money in your life to pay that debt back, then I think we have to ask ourselves a question about whether there was value for money in that degree that was being offered. So I think we do need to look at that. But um, I also have a particular worry about the system, which is, although on the whole the reforms have worked, I cannot, when I knock on someone's door, justify why the interest rate on tuition fee loans should be 6%. I just don't think it's fair. <laughs> And 
and, and I think we risk discrediting the whole system with those unfair interest rates. And we've got Corbyn, who's promising it's all going to be free. Um, and uh, we know those Labour promises don't add up, but they're very attractive to students. And that's why I think we've got to deal with that unfairness. And that's one of the things that I promise. And how much would that cost if you brought the interest rate down? Because presumably the interest rate is so high to compensate for the fact that half students don't ever pay them back. Exactly. That is the, uh, that is the problem with the system that as it stands at the moment, half the students don't pay their loans back. And one of the reasons for that is because the interest rates are so high so that they get out of people's reach. That policy would cost £1.3 billion a year. Uh, we can afford it within the headroom that we have. My commitment is that we'll carry on reducing borrowing as a proportion of GDP over the cycle. But I just say that if you don't want to spend that money, you risk uh, letting into government someone who's going to scrap the whole system. And that will cost us a lot more, reduce the quality of our education in our universities, and in the end be the wrong thing for young people. Right, after David Trezzy's David Cosham. David. Good afternoon, Jeremy. What are your plans to bring our care of the elderly, the young, the disabled, and the mentally unwell to a world-class standard? Will your plans be given priority over tax cuts for the well-off? Thank you, David. Um, very, very important issue in this part of the world where you have a higher than average proportion of over 70s. Obviously, no one in this room today. Um, <laughs> none of you look a day over 40. But, um, uh, but David, I was responsible for the NHS and towards the end my job title changed to be um, responsible for health and social care. And I got a 10-year funding settlement for the NHS and my next job was to get a 10-year funding settlement for social care. And I passionately want to do this because we must as Conservatives uh, be a country, uh, build a country where every single older person is treated with dignity and respect. And I think that local council budgets have been very, very stretched. And I think that we've got to the point where they're not able to discharge the duties in the way that we as Conservatives would want. So uh, we do need to put more resources into the social care system. I introduced some big reforms. But we've also got to be, as the party of personal responsibility, we've got to change the culture for younger people so that just as people save for their pension, they also save for their social care costs. And I would like to have a system where, uh, just as we auto-enroll for our pension, and we've got millions more people saving for their pensions than we're saving before 2010, I think we need to create the incentives so that the vast majority of people are also saving for those social care costs that they're going to have in those last critical months of their life when all of us would want people to get the care they need. Just to follow up on that, though, so, some people would say, is my microphone working? Yeah, it's um, so, is it going to work? Um, some, pe yeah. well, some people would say that you were health secretary for six years, you had ample time to bring in all of these reforms that would have solved these problems. Well, I... Uh, I, I, the, I let me repeat the question because uh, it was... It was uh, a bit of hostile fire, so I'll... Uh, but, but he said, basically, Ian said, look, you were health secretary for six years, couldn't you have sorted out these problems when you were there? And the answer is that, you know, while I was health secretary, we were dealing with big shortfalls in cash. Um, we still managed to raise standards to get more people using good or outstanding hospitals. But I recognised that with an ageing population, we needed a fundamentally different financial settlement. And that was why, as we got the economy back on its feet, I made the argument to the Treasury and to Theresa May for a big increase in funding, and uh, we got that extra 20 billion. But I always said in those discussions that we needed to do something for the social care system as well. And there's a very simple reason for that, which is that uh, too many hospital beds are taken up by people who should be discharged into the community, where actually it's cheaper to look after people. It's, much nicer for them as well. Um, so you can't just solve the problems in the NHS and not look at what needs to happen in the social care system. Um, right, after, is this not working either? <laughs> after, well, I've seen it. 
After David Cosham, we will have Sally Stevens. Right. I'm <laughs> Is it? <laughs> okay. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say that I think we would all agree we've got two very impressive candidates in front of us today. Um, I sense something is coming after yeah, that. <laughs> there, is a, there is a however, because I want to ask you, Jeremy, what you're trying to achieve in this campaign when you do throw the occasional insult at your opponent, and I'm thinking of the word coward in particular. Well, um, David. <laughs> Let me say this. I have been asked about a thousand times in the last week to make comments about Boris's personal life, and I have rejected every single one. But we do need to have a debate on very important issues. For example, would you call an election if Parliament blocks a no-deal Brexit? I think that's something the Conservative Party needs to know where both candidates stand. I said I won't call an election because I think that would be a mistake. And I do think we should have head-to-head -head debates um, and have these issues out. And I think we should have those debates before people cast their votes. Uh, this time next week, uh, many of you, if not all of you, will actually have your postal ballot papers. And being conscientious conservatives, I expect many people will vote by return. And you know, we should allow people to have those head-to-head -head, head -head debates or see those head-to-head -head debates before they vote. And at the moment, uh, the other lot are saying they'll only have head-to-head -head debates after many people have voted, and I think that's wrong. Um, right, Sally, see, this isn't working. Right. Am, I, am I jinxing these microphones? Ah, oh, now it's working. Try now. Excellent. LBC. We don't have these problems on LBC. Um, Sally Stevens. Hey, <laughs> Sally Stevens. <laughs> Followed by Annika Friedland. Uh, good morning. Which failings as a minister can you learn from the most as PM? Well, um, this could be a long answer um, because I think that you make mistakes the whole time in your lives. And I think the really important thing is whether you, not whether you make a mistake or not, but whether you learn from it. And um, probably the most difficult and bitter battle that I've had to fight um, as a Secretary of State was the junior doctor's strike. It actually lasted for um, almost as long as the miners' strike. It was a very, very bitter and difficult dispute. And I felt passionately, because of the issues that I was talking about earlier, that we need to have a seven-day NHS where the care is every bit as good on Saturday and Sunday as it is in the week. And so I felt that this was an argument that I needed to have. But what I realized in the course of that dispute was that I wasn't getting my mes message across to the junior doctors themselves. I got it across to Conservative Party members who were incredibly supportive, to colleagues in the House of Commons who backed me to the hilt. But these 51,000 junior doctors who are amazing people work incredibly hard. They're the future of the NHS. Um, uh, I couldn't get my message across to them. And what I learned from that is that we, I, but also all of us as conservatives, have to be better on social media. Because I thought, you know, they'd, they'd be listening to the Today programme, watching the BBC, all these things, but actually they're getting their information from Facebook and Twitter. And if you're not present in all those social media groups, you're not getting your message across. And so that's why, as Prime Minister, I want to approach social media in a very different way. I think you have to involve people much more in what you're doing every single day, what you're thinking, the dilemmas you have. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to go Trump on social media in case anyone's <laughs> worrying, but I do think that we have to engage, um, and uh, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned. You did go a bit Trump, though, didn't you, the other day? Um, in which example? When you were doing your, your Twitter hour. Um, ah, yes, we had a... Somebody asked you what your opinion of was of journalists who write about people's private lives, and you said they're all a bunch of... Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, the question was, 
Um, what do you say, what do you think about the journalists who get your last name well, wrong? That was a, that was a, <laughs> right. And that's what I said to that one, but yes. It's yeah. sort of fake news um, Right, Annika Friedland followed by Peter Walsh. Jeremy, welcome to Devon, place of my birth, but brought up on the continent. My question is, since Iran, with whom we have the nuclear treaty, is the originator and sponsor of Hezbollah, a terrorist organization, can we trust Iran to allow us full inspection of all uranium producing plants in Iran? And in that case, do we have sufficient inspections? Well, thank you for asking that question, Annika, because it reminds us that while we worry about Brexit and you know, the social care system in our country and all the other things we've been talking about this morning, there are things happening in other parts of the world that could tip us into a global world war if we get them wrong. And, uh, your question about inspections, I, I, I am confident that we have a system in place for inspecting Iran's nuclear facilities. It's done by the International Atomic Energy Authority. But um, fundamentally, you're right. Uh, the root cause of what's going on in the Middle East is the fact that Iran is sponsoring terrorism all over the Middle East, destabilizing countries like Syria, Yemen, uh, Lebanon, uh, where Hezbollah, which they sponsor, are attacking Israel. And you know what is absolutely extraordinary? When it is clear as daylight that Iran was attacking these tankers uh, going up the Straits of Hormuz, Jeremy Corbyn goes out and says, it's all America's fault. And what does that say about how dangerous this man would be if he was ever allowed to get into number 10? He can't even tell the difference between right and wrong in something as simple as that. Um, I'm going to read these two questions out myself because they were asked to Boris Johnson as well. Um, Peter Walsh is asking, bearing in mind the quality of the two candidates, will whoever is successful bring the other into their cabinet? And if losing, what position would they like? Well, um, of course, uh, I would love to have Boris in my cabinet. I think. Uh, uh, if there was a Secretary of State for collective responsibility, I think that would be a good post for him to take responsibility for. But, you know, Boris is someone of enormous talent. He's changed the course of our history through his leadership of the Leave campaign. And um, he should always have a very big role in taking things forward. Um, so in terms of what role he would have, I mean, I think that's a discussion that you know, I would have with him in that situation. Would I serve him? Of course. We're in a, an incredibly difficult situation. I think whoever doesn't win in this contest needs to put their shoulder to the wheel and serve loyally the winner so that we can get through this, get to the other side and uh, give the country all the exciting things that and we want to do. presumably like to stay in the, your current job? Well, I love my current job, but, you know, uh, I think these are all... Uh, these are the details. I think the important thing is that both of us uh, should be willing to serve the other if things don't work out the way that we want. And when you and when you say Minister for Collective Responsibility, was that another little jibe that this gentleman was talking about? It was a, it was a light-hearted dig. Uh, no more. And I think Boris is quite capable of taking a few light-hearted digs. And Steve Smith, how will you run your government? Sofa or boardroom? Uh, I'm much more of a boardroom person, but uh, I think boardroom uh, sounds a little bit formal. Um, I think what you need to do is uh, have small meetings where you can get a group of people sitting around the table and on important issues, meet at least weekly, sometimes more often than that. The trouble in government compared to the business world is that the number of people coming to meetings tends to explode and before you know it you've got 20, 30 people who all want to sit in a meeting and then another 20 or 30 people sitting around the edge of the table. And it's very difficult to have those really frank 
precise conversations that you need. That's a really good point. Are you going to get rid of all of these ministers who attend the cabinet? Just have a 22-member cabinet, so it actually means something to be a member of a cabinet. Yeah. Well, um, I think, you know, in the last uh, nine years, I've seen how cabinet can work and also how cabinet can fail. And there are various constitutional reasons why you have people sitting around the table, and there's only actually a handful of people who attend cabinet, but the most important thing is that you need to have a cabinet where everyone uh, is discreet about what's discussed. Because if stuff is relayed to the media afterwards, <laughs> you just can't have the frank conversations you need. Adrian McMahon, followed by Laurie Haynes. What is your specific strategy for eliminating what I think is the scourge of illegal drug usage and the associated criminality if you were to become our next Prime Minister? Well, thank you, Adrian. Um, and uh, let me make two observations. Um, one thing that I have never understood is why we don't have a more active and determined approach to having drugs-free prisons. Because um, we have far too many drugs in our prisons. This is a place where you could treat people to wean them off the addiction they have so that when they go back out into the world, they don't need to go back to the criminality to pay for their drug taking. And uh, when I was health secretary, I started a pilot to see if we could actually have our first drugs-free prison, and I think that would be a starting point. But um, let me talk about the root causes more often. <clears throat> I think that uh, two things. First of all, one the state can do and one that all of us can do. In terms of what the state can do, uh, too many young people leave school not able to read and write properly. And I think that those people are the people most likely to lose hope in our society. They're the ones least likely to get a decently paid job. And if we could sort out that problem in our education system, be the Conservative government that abolishes illiteracy, that would be a big step forward. But there's a family point as well. There's a fascinating study from Iceland which shows that parents that spend more time with their children are less likely to have obese children and less likely to have children who take drugs or children who become alcoholics. And I think we need to look at experiments such as the one that they had in Iceland, uh, which had a dramatic impact in reducing drug use. OK, we've got five and a half minutes left. I've got two questions here, so we can get at least two questions, uh, spontaneous ones from the audience. Let's go from Laurie to Mike Saunders. Laurie. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, the UK arms export trade. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, our very valuable uh, export uh, trade in arms is worth about three billion, of which, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, around 40% goes to Saudi Arabia. So my question is, as PM, um, would your uh, Department of Trade uh, stimulate arms exports, and especially to Saudi Arabia? Well, first of all, we are a country that understands that if you want democracy, if you want basic freedoms, you have to defend them. So I'm not someone who says that the arms trade is wrong or illegal, but we have in this country some of the toughest controls on the export of arms of anywhere in the world. They're tougher than the EU's, so uh, we do export to Saudi Arabia, but there is a very strict licensing system actually set up by Robin Cook back in 2000, which we follow. And I think that providing we follow those guidelines, then I'm happy for um, British manufacturers to benefit. But one of the things that we won't do is export arms if we think that there's a risk that they could be used in a way that will violate international humanitarian law. And that's what we look at very, very carefully. But I think it's also important to remember that Saudi Arabia is an ally of ours, um, but we, that means with our allies, we talk straight when we disagree. And I've had very uncomfortable meetings 
with the leaders of Saudi Arabia after the Khashoggi murder. I've been very clear that that's against our values. But that doesn't mean that we don't work closely with them when we need to. And right now in the Middle East, we need to work closely with them because that is the tinderbox region of the world. And it's very, very dangerous. Right, Mike Saunders, please. Uh, Mike Saunders, Chairman of the Gloucestershire Young Conservatives and fellow NHS enthusiast with my occupation in the NHS Blood and Transplant. My question is uh, on uh, housing. Uh, with councils producing an attractive shared ownership new builds and banks only offering mortgages of four times one salary, which with the average salary would total £112,000 with the help to buy ISA, how are you going to solve our generation rent and make the Conservative Party the party of home ownership again? Yes, um, Mike, that's a, a really, that's a matter of trust actually for young people because uh, they look at us, my generation, and they say, you bought your houses, um, they've appreciated in value, and that's nice for you, but what about us? And uh, what would I do very practically? Well, Margaret Thatcher had her right to buy policy, which got one and a half million council tenants onto the housing ladder. I've got a policy called Right to Own, which will help one and a half million younger people get onto the housing ladder if they can't afford a deposit. And it's based on the principle of giving people land that already has planning permission, so that all they have to finance from their mortgage is the cost of actually building the house, which is normally a small fraction of the land value. And uh, if we grant planning permission as a state to land that we already own, then the increase in value can go to the young person trying to get onto the housing ladder and not to the property developer. And I think this is a scheme that could make a massive difference to young people all over the country. Right, time for two more questions. I'm vainly looking for a female hand in the air. And I can't... No, you're not a female, sir. <laughs> Maybe you're on Saturday nights, but it's There's not one. Saturday. There's one. There's, There's one. There's one. Right, microphone over to this lady here, please. And another one here. Marvellous. Is this on? Go on. Rosemary Berry from Mid Devon. Uh, you haven't mentioned, and Boris wasn't questioned on this, how you understand the impact of a no deal Brexit on the farming community. Devon is one of the largest agricultural counties and produces some of the best food in the world. Well, I've... <laughs> Thank you, um, Rosemary. Actually, I went to a farm in Devon this morning, um, which uh, is a wonderful place that makes a huge amount of cheese. And, um, and I talked about this very issue uh, with the person running the business. And the fact is that the farming sector would be one of the most adversely affected by the tariffs that would be introduced in a no-deal situation. Of course, we would find support for them in that situation, but it would be very challenging. And that's why I think we should try our very hardest to get a deal so that we don't have that kind of disruption. Um, sheep farming is, is an industry that could be devastated. I met a sheep farmer who exported 95% of his lamb to Europe. 40% tariff on that lamb could wipe him out overnight. So that's why it's so important to work hard for a deal, and that's what I'll do. And, to, and presumably, the no deal planning would take that into account, so you would have to pay compensation to farmers in that position. Um, well, um, someone, a lady over there said, How about buying British? Of course, that is true. In a no deal situation, you would have. A readjustment. There'd be some farmers who would actually do well in that situation, but there would be disruption. And it's not just for farmers, but for manufacturers and for many other businesses. And that's why we've got to have a really strong package we've to support them. Brief question and brief answer. Uh, uh, oh, all right, okay. Over here. We got <coughs> you said you don't want the Where's that? Have you got the microphone? No, wait, 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 wait. We've got to have the microphone. I, I can repeat it if you want. You've said you don't want an election to get Brexit through Parliament, but if the House stops you, it's at a complete impasse. How do you move forward? Because 
you have to negotiate a deal, and I believe I can negotiate a deal. I talk to European leaders, and they don't want a no-deal Brexit either. And if we approach this the right way, a proper negotiation, um, I think we can get a deal. But, you know, it is wrong for Parliament to take no deal off the table. That is a very, very important part of our negotiating leverage. It's one of the reasons that it was difficult for Theresa May, because the Europeans in the end believed that we wouldn't walk away. And so, you know, I would urge my colleagues in Parliament not to take no deal off the table, because actually if they do that, we're less likely to get a deal. I now owe Boris Johnson two extra minutes in Carlisle tomorrow. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for coming today. Please give a, a thank you to Jeremy Hunt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you. 